Well, good evening and welcome to another one of our fly tying live streams with me, Alex Jardine. Uh, today, we're going to look at something a little bit different. And um, rather than uh, the rivers that we've been looking at uh, over the past few streams, we're now going to change over and start looking at uh, still water for this session. Um, many of us uh, in the UK um, have access to uh, numerous uh, great to look at a small selection of my favorite flies for this kind of situation. Starting off with an incredibly simple fly, but incredibly effective at the same time. And you'll see a common theme through many of my um, streams. I love a simple fly. Partly a uh, simple fly, if you lose it, you can replace it easily. Um, so it's not too painful. Um, but also it means you can tie lots of them quickly uh, and have you ready in fishing and being able to spend more time on the water than at the vise. So to begin with, um, we've got a partridge K4AY uh, grub hook. Uh, that is a barbless hook. Um, some of you may prefer barbed hooks for this kind of fishing. Um, it's either or, uh, it's up to your personal preference. I'm quite happy on barblets. Um, and then I've matched it up with, uh, you'll see a little counter sunk bead. Uh, this is actually a tungsten bead. Um, it took a long time. I used to use only brass beads in my still water fishing. Uh, but after fishing more on rivers, I saw the value of tungsten being that bit heavier. Um, so I've started bringing that over more into my still water flies as well. Um, so here, simple countersunk bead uh, in blood red, uh, just to go with obviously the fly, the blood worm. Thread wise, uh, I've gone much thicker than I would normally go for other flies. Um, we've got the Semperfly wax thread uh, in an 8 in red. Uh, this is perfect for doing uh, thread bodies where we're looking to build up bulk much quicker than we would when we're, gener when we're generating a body uh, from other materials. So simply begin our thread turns behind the bead and wind it down, touching turns. So we're looking to get the color coming through of that thread as that's the prime focus in this fly. Uh, and we'll take it all the way back to where we want the fly to go, which is almost at the point where that bend reaches its extremity and double it back on itself and then touching turns all the way back to the bead. Um, some of you may have or may have seen uh, curved hooks that come in different colors. Uh, one of the great ones for this particular pattern uh, are gold hooks as well. Uh, that can really make that red thread pop out. Um, it can look a bit garish to tie on to begin with, but it is a really effective hook to use for this style of fly. Now we're going to attach um, our rib, uh, which is the Semperfly flat tinsel uh, in pearl. Uh, nice and fine. Uh, this one's um, small or 164th of an inch. Um, and it's a lovely pearly holographic color. Um, and it really adds an element to the fly. So to tie that in, I've cut a small section off there. I'll take the tag end and pass it into the bead and take one thread turn over. Once that's trapped in, oh, try and actually trap it in. Uh, but once that's trapped in, we want to then put touching turns because we need to now hide that flash, which is going to be shining through. And we only want it to show through where, well, 
that's not ideal. It's the first time on one of these, so the thread is broken, but we'll just fix that nice and quickly. To be honest, I'm surprised this hasn't happened sooner. Oh, well. Back and going. All I'm going to do is take that back. So the joy of doing this live is obviously we can't edit anything out. So it does happen. You've got proof now. And I'm going to take all of those back. And now I'm just going to take this thread out the way by winding it back up to the front of the hook. And I'm going to trim out those two little tabs from where we've restarted our tying. Right, there we go. Well, back to normal. Now we want to continue our thread work. Now we're building a taper going forward. So we don't need to take our threads all the way back to the beginning. We just want to build up the bulk towards the bead. So it will taper up and eventually it will get to a similar thickness to, to the bead. And there we go. You'll see that shape beginning to form now. Sometimes the Take it back a little bit further just to keep that a consistent taper. And there we go. You want to leave a little bit of room now to build up a few more thread turns uh, for the whip finish. And now we're going to work our rib forward. So whenever doing on a curved hook, especially whenever doing the first one, I'll always just pin it in position with my spare hand. Otherwise, it can sometimes slide all the way back down, which can be incredibly infuriating. And nice open turns. Try and get them so they open up a little bit more with each turn until your final one by the bead there. Two turns over the top, fold it back, and couple of locking turns in front and then we can trim that out the way get rid of that and then in with our trusty whip finish tool uh, you can also obviously hand finish if you prefer at this point but up and out the way once twice for good measure although we're going to do some glue work on this which again, if you've seen any of the previous videos, is quite unusual for me. Um, but it does help. It's actually part of the um, part of the fly rather than just a security. So we've got the thread work uh, all in place. Now um, we've got some Semperfly NoTac UV resin. Uh, obviously, any any UV resin will do a similar job. Uh, the joy with UV resins over other glues is you don't have to mix them and because unless you're in a really sunny place which unfortunately we're not at the moment um, they don't set straight away so you've got plenty of time to shape your glue the way that you want it So you don't have any big build-ups in any plates. Whereas obviously if you're working with a super glue, you've either got a really long drying time or it 
dries too quickly and you don't have time to sort out any of the bumps. Bumps aren't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, they obviously make the fly look unique and natural, but then it's also important that you have a fly that you're happy to tie on the end. Um, so make sure that you've done it, got the glue the way that you want. You'll always get a bump on the downward side so you can flip the vise over if you want. Then get your Shosti UV torch um, to do the job of uh, the lack of sun at the moment. And we can just rotate that round steadily in the vines just to make sure that there's a, a full covering. I find with this particular torch that it doesn't dry fully straight away. So what I tend to do is pop them in little clips and then leave them in the windowsill to, to harden up properly. Um, and go. The, uh, the best thing to do is to tie these in in batches uh, so you have a series that you can um, uh, that you can cure all at the same time. Um, but that's largely done and ready to go. So there you have it. That is try and see if this will do this. Probably fly off. Um, so we've got the thread bloodworm, a perfect small still water pattern, whether fishing blind or if you are lucky enough to have clear waters, you can use this as a as a stalking bug. So prowling around the outside of the lake edges and um, just peering over and targeting any fish that you spot along the way. Uh, you can see their reaction. And the nice thing with the bright color of the fly is that you can you can quite often watch it as it sinks down through the water. So it can be a perfect stalking bug as well. So moving on, uh, keeping it still subsurface, we're now going to look at a fly. Uh, it's a spider pattern. Uh, I've coined this one, uh, the green peacock spider, uh, very simply because that is basically the materials that are involved. Um, Hookwise, uh, we've got the partridge um, G3AY. Uh, again, uh, this is a barbless hook. Uh, you can get the um, uh, you can get the barbed version of this, which I think off the top of my head is the L3AY. Um, this is a great hook, heavy wire, um, nice standard shank. Uh, so the reason I've gone heavy wire is I want this fly to, to actually sink a little bit. Um, and spiders you may think of as a, as a river fly, um, so traditional English wet flies. Um, and, it, and I did as well. Um, it wasn't until um, oh, quite a few years ago now. Uh, we were looking, um, uh, I, we were on the um, fishery called Elodine up in Shropshire. Uh, if you've not been there, um, well worth a visit. Uh, stunning fishery uh, run by Ed and Jane. Um, and we looked at ways to target fish that were slightly different. Uh, and one of the ways that we, we thought about was um, fishing just subsurface or um, sort of within that top top sort of water column uh, for fish that are actively feeding. Something which you don't always associate with small still waters, but they do. They're avid feeders within uh, all water, um, water types. Uh, so we looked at spider patterns, which are a great way of imitating um, most aquatic insects because you've got a bit of movement, you've got a nice body shape. Um, and the reason for picking um a spider as it worked for uh, in particular midges that were just under the surface moving around um so threadwise this time um still on the red and the wax thread but now a 12 o rather than an 8 o uh, and the reason for going slightly finer is 
uh, we're now building a separate body material in. Uh, so I, I prefer the thinner thread uh, to be able to get more turns and a bit more play. So we'll start our thread, uh, the front half there. So I've doubled it back on, so that's all secure. And we're going to tie in uh, the wing material first. So wing-wise, um, for this particular pattern, you want, I mean, you can vary it to suit what you want. You want quite a drab feather, so either a water hen or, uh, or just a standard uh, mallard um, wing is perfect. Uh, you want to go for a material that, a feather that's going to be quite webbed uh, and quite soft in nature uh, because you want it to, um, you want it to um, drape around the hook. And as is always the way, finding the right size feather it can be a bit of a mission. Uh, and the reason for this is you end up tying a lot of similar sized flies. So all your favorite feathers just disappear. And you'll see the feather that we're picking, it really doesn't look very significant when compared to a full uh, a full chicken feather, so a, a rooster saddle or something like that. Preparing the feather, we want to get rid of the fluffy fibers down at the bottom. Uh, and then we want to start brushing it back and getting all these fibers that we want in our fly combed backwards. So your feather should look roughly like that. So with a parting and the tip section, and then we turn it round. So the tip is facing back and the curvature of the feather is going upwards. And we'll take this forward just a bit in front of the eye of the hook and we'll trap that down and depending on how long the tip section ends we can just cut out any excess fibers and work with our thread to take it back down to the back we're going to take this forward again and I'm going to get in my body material now, which is a slightly different one if you've obviously not come across it before. Uh, so this again is a Semperfly product called Quill Sub uh, and it's designed to be exactly that, to be a substitute for quills. Uh, this particular color is um, peacock green uh, and it's uh, in small. And I've got this. Uh, and being a combined material, it's got a, a thin thread running all the way through it, which gives it some extra strength, which makes it possible to to wind it like a thread through a bobbin holder rather than just being a, a tinsel. So I've trapped that in and turns can be relatively loose. Just gonna hook that over there. And trim those out of the way. And in order to give yourself a bit of room for the time being, let's give that a quick whip finish and snip it out. Uh, we're going to bring that back in in a second, but it just allows you the room to start winding your quill sub forward. And you'll see it's giving a nice range of flash and various colors as well coming through that. 
and because it's that mixture of materials each turn is different from the turn before then we can actually whip finish this material as well you just have to do it a bit more carefully than you would a normal thread just so it doesn't catch up on itself but there we are that's all in place and now all we need to do is get our thread back on there so to do that use your thumbnail and angle that hackle in take your thread around and pop it in front of the hackle there cut out the excess and now we're going to actually bring the hackle around so get your hackle pliers trim the end catch the end in there might send the fingers a little bit and strike the fibers back that will help help them sit better on the hook making sure that they're all facing forward just keep coaxing them backwards and that will make sure that you've got a wonderful draping wing then so you've done one full turn and you're looking to bring up and do a second one then bring your thread over and just drop it down and again and then bring your thread in front there hopefully that will stay in place go in with your scissors trim that out of the way you might find that it even needs on so you can just pick those out stroke everything back so it's out the way while you do your final thread turns and your neatening up of the head area and now you can go in with the whip finish tool and bring this round And there you have it, it's a, a green peacock spider, so great still water pattern. Either fished on a, on a floater um, with maybe um, as part of a team of flies, uh, or fished on an intermediate, or probably the best line of all is to fish it on a midge tip or a, or a very short, um, short sink tip with an intermediate sink tip. So it's fished just underneath the surface and held there uh, and fished on a level. And as it as you retrieve it on probably a medium paced figure of eight, you can do a slow figure of eight, that wing will just close and open out and it will hold air bubbles and look really buggy as it comes through the water. So there you have it, a great fly for any small still water. So now coming even higher up in the water this time, uh, we're going to do a dry fly. Um, there should always be a dry fly in any still waters box. Um, it might not come out as often as in a river scenario, but when the fish are rising and feeding on the top, you always want to have the option of being able to um, being able to chop and change and and catching a rising fish. It's it's hard to beat. Um, so this particular pattern uh, is a shuttlecock. Uh, so similar to uh, the spider previously, um, this fly is designed to look predominantly like midges hatching out, um, but does cover a range of things. Uh, this particular one is an olive um, olive shuttlecock merger. And uh, hookwise, we've got the Partridge SLD2. So 
slightly heavier wire than their normal than their uh, sort of main dry fly hook, but I prefer it uh, for a still water environment. Uh, thread wise, we've got the Semperfly um, wet silk 12 0 in red, and we're just going to start our thread turns. Always leave a little bit of room at the eye just for the end of the fly. It's, um, it's good practice as much as anything. Trim out our tag end there. Take this forward a little bit. And we're going to tie in our rib material. Uh, so the rib material on this one, it's the Semperfly uh, flat tinsel in pearl. Um, 1 64th of an inch, so small. Uh, and it really just am, helps to add a little bit of segmentation in the fly. Um, but also, um, also a little bit of color and a little bit of glitter just to try and grab the fish's attention as it's passing by. So I take it back to the end of the straight part of the shank. And we're going to try and have that tints out of the way. And we'll get our, our body material, uh, which this time, um, anyone that's watched the videos before will know this is a bit of a favorite of mine. It's the Nature Spirit uh, African Goat Dubbing. Uh, color is medium olive, uh, which is a, a great color. The, the lovely thing about this natural dubbing is during the dyeing process, obviously some fibers take to the dye better than others. So you end up with um, a real variety of, of olives going on, which makes it a really realistic dubbing. Um, so it's similar to Seal's Fur in its approach. It's slightly easier to dub. Uh, but to dub it, try and dub really tight a small bit at the top, and then you'll be able to tighten up later these lower sections so try and get that one first turn to catch and now you'll be able to tighten everything up and as you go forward you don't want to worry too much about the dubbing getting quite spiky um, but we want to build a little bit of a taper as it goes forward There we go. And now we're going to, so you'll see that taper slightly. And uh, now we're going to get our rib material and just start to wind through it. Try and wind, or my own preference with this is to wind with the dubbing. And then that way it will sit a little bit more in the dubbing so it won't be too garish if you wind against the dubbing so the opposite direction and um, the rib then will really pop out uh, and it will give you a slightly different effect so we've to hide that off at the front and now i'm just trying to give myself a little bit of room there but you'll see we've got some nice spiky fibers still um, and everything's looking good now we're going to get our wing material um which is uh, an old dry fly favorite really um you can go back and look at one of the other videos for river patterns but it's uh, the cdc feather um for any anybody tying dry flies um cdc is a is a must have material uh, it's just so buoyant um it and very lifelike it just hits all the right boxes so now i've got three feathers um all of similar size and length and what i'm trying to do is match the tips up and getting them all concaving in the same direction and because when i tie this in i want them all to be uniform in length so we have a nice wing shape uh, and to avoid having any bulk in the wrong places. And so 
I've got my three there. Now I'm stroking all the fibers. I want as much of those good fibers going forward into the wing as possible. So we've got them all there. And now I want about the body length in front of the hook for the wing. So tip facing forwards. I'll now place that against the shank of the hook. Bring a th thread up and trap it between your thumb and forefinger. Make a loop and pull straight down. And then do place a couple of more locking turns in. Now you can stroke that wing back and place a couple of turns in front. That will be lovely and secure now. And we can go in with the scissors and just cut that as tight as we can. And then tidy it up with a bit of thread. Uh, and then we'll go back with our dubbing. Same dubbing as before for the African goat in the olive. And mix a bit on. And we're just going to tidy up where that thread's built up. So you may wonder why I'm using an, a red thread rather than an olive thread. Um, basically, when I come to finish the fly, I just like that little spot of red just at the front. Whether the fish care, uh, I've got no idea, but it, it makes me happier knowing that it's there. Um, quite a lot of the um, buzzers, the midges, when they hatch off, will have a little orange patch just behind the wing, um, which is incredibly uh, visible to the trout. So if you can add a little bit of orange or red in there, uh, I feel it just adds another element to the fly. Uh, obviously that. Uh, and that's all there. So that's your, your dry fly for small still water fishing. Um, an olive um, CDC shuttlecock emerger. Uh, you can grease that up a little bit. Use a powder floatant. That will sit like that in the water. So this body material will be subsurface and the wing will be floating. And any day when you've got rising trout on a still water, that's always a great option to have in your box. So now uh, we're moving over to the dark side. Um, we've done the nice things, um, but any of you that do lake fish will know nine times, uh, say nine times out of 10, a good 50, 60% of the time, um, we do require something a bit more garish to grab their attention. Um, and there are countless flies out there uh, that do this job. Um, but one of my go to uh, all time favorites uh, is the Nomad. Um, a fly um, developed, or oh, probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but back in the 80s, um, it was um, oh, just a small still water classic. Uh, hook wise, uh, this time we've got the G, uh, Parchers G3AY, uh, so heavier wire hook, nice strong hook. Uh, this is a barbless one, there are barb versions. Um, bead, uh, we've got a tungsten bead, uh, again, brass or tungsten, um, it's up to you. Uh, counter sunk in gold. Um, important, it's important to be counter sunk, you'll get. Uh, the materials will tie much better with it. Um, and the positioning of the bead is key to this particular fly. So rather than having it at the front, like we would most flies, this time we position it halfway down the shank. Um, it makes it a bit of a pain for starting the fly. Uh, but the thought process behind that is so that the fly will sink um, level. Rather than diving nose down first, uh, the fly will sink with a much more uh, level uh, atmosphere, and that means when it's fishing, it's coming 
forward through the water level rather than up and down, up and down. Uh, and it really hones in on the, um, the style that the rainbow trout particularly feed on, which they like to feed on a level plane uh, rather than coming up through the water column. Threadwise, uh, to begin with, uh, we've got the Semperfly Wax Thread uh, 80 uh, in red. And this is purely to help us build um, the front part of the fly. So start right at the eye of the hook and touching turns, going back to just over halfway. So it's key to go just over halfway, even though the beads are going to sit a little bit further forward. We're now going to take those back down. And we're looking to build a tapered, a tapered nose that's actually tapering towards the back of the fly here. A little bit more. And keep it going. You'll see that nose beginning to form. And see how that bead now is just sat there. And sorry, always hard to talk when you're just doing lots of thread turns. But nearly there. So now we're just going to make sure we've got nice coverage going all the way down to the front. In with the whip finish tool. Up front and finish that off. Try and get that bead back there quick, just so we don't lose any of those thread turns that we've put in. We'll cut that out, and now we're going to go with our UV resin, um, which is a bit of a saving grace, I have to say. Uh, once upon a time, it was just a case of putting layers and layers of super glue on so you would do them in big batches uh, so you could do one layer it usually took about three or four layers to build up the consistency that you wanted but now the wonderful uv resin does the job of multiple layers in one go. So I use the needle to try and get a reasonable spread of it around the hook. Obviously you want to try and maintain that taper as much as possible. It's not You can, of course, do some touching up glue work afterwards, but just go in with your UV torch and try and cure some of that off. So it's in position. Again, any of you that do use a UV glue, um, tying a few of these and leaving them in the window to, to fully cure is a good idea afterwards. Um, now for the back half of the fly, um, we're going to change threads this time. Uh, so we're now going for the Semperfly Nano Silk uh, in 180 and black. And we're going to start our thread turns behind the bead and take it to the back of the hook there. 
And we're going to trim our thread out. And we're going to tie in our tailing material, uh, which we're going to use uh, marabou, which is a wonderful feather for movement and making any any kind of swimming fly. Um, there are few materials that are quite as good, but it's key that you pick the right part of the feather. If you watch American tying in particular, you'll find that they tie a lot with the tips of the feather. But if I hold that there, you see how there's no movement. It's really quite stiff and fine, which is fine for river streamers. But in a lake where you don't have the current to give you movement, you want to work on these middle feathers. You'll see how they pulsate a lot more. Uh, they're the ones that are going to give you the movement and entice the fish into taking your fly. So take from that middle and lower part of the feather uh, whenever you're tying a still water, still water fly. Unless you're looking, obviously, not to have the movement, but then that probably isn't the material if you're trying to do that. Uh, so I've taken a nice amount, just pairing them up, removing any parts that I don't want. Uh, so we've got a nice clump. Now I'm going to moisten my fingers and just rotate the clump there. Uh, that just holds everything together, and we can trim that down to a nice edge. Um, by doing that, it makes it a lot easier to tie in. We can line it up with that bead now, and just place our thread turn over the top, and trap it all down. Nice thing with that nano silk, is you can really put the pressure on it so really secure try not to tie in too big too big a clump uh, the problem with tying in a big clump of marabou is it can sometimes rotate round the hook so if you're finding that's happening uh, there are two things you're either not securing it down tight enough or you're just simply tying in too much so try and work out the bulk that you need in order to give you the fly that you want but also not to um uh, not to allow your thread and fly to rotate around so now all i'll do is take this back and pinch any of the tips out that i don't want with my fingernail you don't want to cut, you want to tear out with your fingernail. Uh, that will give you a much nicer finish rather than just a sharp cut on the end. So we've got our wing in plates, uh, our tail in plates. Now we're going to go with the body. Uh, this is just a basic micro chenille in black. Um, and this is a lovely simple material um, to use so tying with chenille all you can do is pull out some of those materials which will leave you just with the center cord center cord is much easier to tie in and a bit like the marabou rather than trying to tie in all of the material by just tying in the cord it gives you much more control when you're tightening that in uh, tying in with Fritz can really be tricky for wrapping around the hook. So that's all secure in place. Now pull it up, light hackling, rotate round and just stroke back with each turn. Make sure everything's tight and in place. So with each turn, just stroke back. So you're not trapping down fibers and so they're all facing in the direction that they'll go when you're fishing the fly. 
can, I can probably just bring that up once. And take our thread through. And once more, pull the thing back and drop the thread down a couple of times. Allow that bead just to slide the thread in. And we can trim that out, brush out anything that we don't want there, and then get our trusty whip finish tool. And one, two, three, up, and once more for good measure. And there you have it, one of the best still water fish catchers that I've ever had in my box. The Nomad, um, whilst this has predominantly worked for me in this country, uh, I've also done really well uh, on the lakes in New Zealand with this, uh, just by varying the colours, uh, sometimes in olive with the red nose. Uh, in the winter, I quite like this uh, white with a, with a lime green or a chartreuse nose. Um, so by all means, have a play with the colours that you tie this on. Um, but it should definitely be in your box. So we've now reached the final fly of the evening. And this has got to be my all time favorite small still water pattern, uh, the Spillers Damsel. Whenever I go to, um, whenever I go to any water, but in particular, a, a new water that I've not fished before. Uh, this is usually the fly that I will tie on uh, at the car. Um, and to be honest, it very seldom, very rarely comes off and uh, is replaced by anything else because it's really effective. There are the odd waters where it doesn't always fish very well. Quite often, quite muddy waters, it, it doesn't always fish very well. But anywhere that runs lovely and clear or with a slight tinge to it anywhere that's got good weed beds this is a, a great pattern as well uh, so hook wise we've got the partridge uh, g3 ay again um bead uh, we've got a copper tungsten bead um countersunk again for because we're tying on a straight shank uh, the countersunk works much better um thread we've got the semperfly wax thread in orange uh, 12 o and very simply start behind the bead build up a little bit of work and take our thread all the way down we can trim out the tag end there keep it going till we get to the end of the straight part of the shank and then we're going to get in our first material of the fly um, which is uh, marabou um, it's a great tailing material um, a great tailing material for any still water pattern uh, again as i was saying don't use any of these tip parts of the feather for still water flies we want to use these wonderful middle parts of the feather where all the movement is. Color wise for this fly, um, you want either an olive um, or a golden olive. Um, quite often I will carry both. Um, the golden olive is my favorite, but always worth having a bit of choice. So take a nice bunch and keep them together moisten your finger and let the whole thing just rotate in between the wet part and you'll see how it's now slightly bound together only reason for doing this is it makes everything easier to tie in give it a nice straight edge and other than just trapping it in there, which will give you 
a lump at the back of the fly that you then have to work out. Tie it the whole length of the shank. Uh, that will mean that it makes your life easier. So trap it in where you want it, get your locking turns in place, and then tighten down all these other fibers. And then use your thread to really bind everything down. We don't want that going anywhere. And take it to the bead. Uh, then your tail. Use your thumbnail just to trim that back to the length that you want it. Key with this particular fly is to leave the tail long. Uh, I know many people like to. They might fish it at that length, get a few tail nips and think, ah, the tail's too long. The fish doesn't get into the hook. They'll pinch or cut the tail to that length and then the tapes just stop. And the reason you're doing that is you're changing the fly. The fish like the fly. Uh, they're taking it. By halving the tail in length, yes, if they nip it, it means that they're closer to the hook, but you're now fishing a different fly. What the fish are often telling you is that actually you're not fishing the fly fast enough. So speed up your retrieve and you'll find that those tail nets suddenly become hookups where the fish are now no longer just nipping at the back, they're taking the whole fly. It takes a bit of getting used to, but it, it really does work. So give it a try if it's happening to you. Uh, now we're going to tie in our rib material. Um, very simply, it's the Semperfly uh, one mil wire in copper. Um, it just helps add a little bit to the fly. Uh, we'll trap that in along the side there. And now we're going to tie in our body material, which is the African goat dubbing. Uh, in medium olive. So like a seals fur, um, the great thing with this is it will give us a long strandy um, strandy body um, which looks like sort of the gill flanks on a on a damselfly. To dub that in, get a nice loose amount and try and secure in the top part first nice and tightly. Uh, the rest just needs to be bound close to the thread. We can work on that later. But it's most important that we get that first turn in. And tighten everything down. Uh, and now begin to take that forward. It's not as important with this fly, but I always think it's worth doing. It's good practice is to try and taper it from thin to thick as you go forward in the fly. Um, whether the fish mind, I don't know, but I think it, it's always a, a good habit to be in. And, ah, there we go. Leave yourself plenty of room at the front there. And um, now we're going to work our rib through. And again, I don't want to trap too many fibers, so I'm taking this through in the direction of the dubbing. So it's just enough to stand out a little bit. Nice open turns, just slightly opening them uh, a little bit more with each turn. Two times over the wire, a few times in front, and then just rotate hold one end of the wire and then use the other hand just to rotate it around and you'll find that that will just break it out and it saves cutting it with your scissors. And now we're going to find our wing material for this particular fly um, which is a golden olive um, partridge uh, feathers right around the neck area. Uh, these are great for anyone that fishes a lot of water with damsels in. This is a must-have material. Um, it 
just completes any dam's limitation. Um, so take your take your feather that you want, remove these fibers down the bottom, the fluffy ones. We don't want those in our fly. So we can just pinch and strip those down. And we'll do that on both sides. And we're left with just the bit of the feather that we want. And now we'll just stroke the fibers back. Helps just to moisten the fingers so they grab and hold on to each other. Or with some stubborn fibers. And then you're left with the tip. For this particular fly, I tie the tip in facing forwards. And have a couple of thread turns in front and a couple behind. And then it's going to cut out the tip of the feather there. And then we're going to find our hackle pliers and position everything where we want it. Get the tail out of the way and grip the feather with the hackle pliers. Moisten the fingers and stroke the fibers back and then begin to wind round and you'll see that hackle opening out all the way up and oops, sorry and round particular feathers done on the bottom so a couple of turns behind and a couple in front now we can Hold the thread out the way while you do this bit. You don't want to cut your thread at the end of a fly. And just trim the hackle stem out the way. And you'll see that lovely hackle just opened up around the fly there. And now we're going to come in with the thorax material, which for this particular fly. Uh, I've got um, some of the Semperfly Sparkle dubbing. Uh, I pick Burnt Orange. Just take a small amount. It's quite a long strand dubbing. Uh, so what I'll do is actually just tear it up a little bit. Make those strands a bit shorter. Just because a material comes one way doesn't mean you can't change it to suit your needs at home and take a small pinch of it tie it to the thread and get a nice tight bit in and build that orange collar up Add a little bit more, and there you go. You've got your orange collar. Get the thread round, and then with your whip finish tool, just get your securing finishes in and trim that out with the scissors. And then with this one. I get my dubbing brush and just stroke back some of those fibers. Just so you've got some of those orange fibers kicking through, but also some of the olive from in the body. Just so this fly's got maximum movement in the water. And there you have it the Spiller's Damsel, my all-time favorite small still water pattern and one 
that I can almost guarantee if you had it in your box, you'll be catching fish. So I hope you've enjoyed this evening and a slight change of scenery from our river flies of, of the previous streams. Um, but there's a, a little glimpse into my Stillwater fly box. And just like all of the videos, uh, tonight's flies will be going into a selection. And for one of uh, one of my subscribers on the YouTube channel, uh, we'll have a chance to win that at the end of the year. Um, if you like this video, please like it and please subscribe to uh, my channel and, and share it amongst friends. And I hope you come back uh, in a fortnight's time for the next Flytime live stream. Thank you very much. Good night.